right, so last question. Mm -hmm. um, collaboration is key here. We, okay. we strongly believe in collaboration. So give some examples of your role in collaboration groups in the past and um, how collaboration has played a role in your planning and other strategies you use to improve yourself as a teacher. Okay. Um, first thing, I think that um, I have been in some good collaborative groups before. Um, there was a situation where one of them where we each kind of had our own specific job within the, the collaborative group. Like I would, uh, I would be the one to search out mentor texts and uh, nonfiction informational texts to use for the other classes and for my classes um, within our grade level. Okay. Um, so that would be my job where someone else might be, you know, creating a test or doing something different. Right. But, um, you know, and that's just one example of what I might be doing. Um, I think collaboration is so important that all your teachers are on the same page and that they are doing the same things within their classrooms so that we can reach other students. Because again, we know how many different learners there are within a classroom and teachers have different ideas and different insights mm -hmm. into lessons. And I think it's important to work as a group to best serve our students right. in class. And um, how else do you improve yourself as a teacher? Do you have um, any go-tos? Um, I think for me, it's just about um, research and internet. I tend to look up things on the internet. I tend to look at articles. Um, I try not to stay too stagnant in what I do in my classroom. Right. Um, it helps that I do tend to get bored, so it's easy for me to look up new and different things to do in class. So I'm always kind of searching for the next cool thing to do yeah all right thank you okay, i have another scenario for you a parent comes in during your planning and demands to see you the principal walks the angry parent down to your room without warning how are you going to handle this situation and have you ever been in a situation with an angry parent if so would you have handled the situation any differently and um how would you deal with the fact that the principal walked the um, parent down without warning Okay. So lots there, and I can repeat yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, first of all, I'm you know that wouldn't be my ideal situation to have a parent come up on me without any kind of notice. I would not be thrilled as a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I would at that point. I think I would have to just hear the hear the parent out because they're there for a reason, and apparently they have a, an issue. So I think it's important that you listen to the parent. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that you are hearing what they are saying. Because a lot of times, we it's really easy to get defensive. And I can tell you, talking about a past experience, that there have been times where I have gotten a little defensive as a teacher. So um, I, sometimes I have to step back and just listen and understand what they're saying and realize that they are their at child's advocate. Mm -hmm. So you've got to understand that they're coming from a different place than where I would be coming from. Right. So um, that's taken some experience and some time mm -hmm. <laughs> for me. Um, and then probably as far as talking to the principal, uh, I would probably after the situation is over and maybe take a few minutes to calm my nerves and then I would talk to my principal about maybe in the future if he or she could just um, give me some, some warning next time or talk to me about it or have the parent call me or just some kind of heads up um, right. in a nice and calm manner. Right. All right. <laughs> So goal setting is important. Mm -hmm. So talk to me how you monitor progress toward end of the year goals and how you have your students monitor their own progress. Okay. Well, first of all, for me monitoring them, uh, I've been in school systems where they've used benchmarks mm -hmm. and I think that they are very helpful. Uh, I then can do a, like an item analysis on what are they getting and what are they not getting. <clears throat> that way I can always intervene what I need to mm -hmm. and move on when I don't need to spend too much time on anything. Right. So um, I you definitely use benchmarks as my kind of all year round assessment of what's going on in the classroom. Yeah. Um, also, I think it's important for the kids to also assess where they're at. Um, standards, standards checklists come in handy and they can see, okay, this I've covered, this I haven't, um, I still need to work on this. That way they can see their grades for each of their standards and know what their weaknesses and their strengths are right. within the class. Wonderful. Okay, so this is a scenario based. I'm going to read it right off the paper. Um, let's say that after the first quarter benchmark assessments, 80% of your students did not score at proficiency. 
Um, the other two teachers in your department scored over 70% above proficiency. So the principal wants you to come up with a plan and meet with him after school to discuss your scores so that he can better support you. What do you think your plan would look like? What do you need from the principal? And how would your classroom and plans look different after this? Okay. I think if that happened, then obviously these two other teachers have something going on that I do not. Um, I think that I would need to meet first with those two teachers, observe them in their classroom, try to get someone to cover mine, while I figure out what's going on in their classrooms that is working so I can adapt that to my classroom. Because I think that um, if I'm that below proficiency, then I'm definitely having problems and something's wrong that I need to work on. So I would definitely make sure I talk to them first and figure out what needs to work and what could be handled in my room mm -hmm. from that point on. Um, I think that um, it's always good to have principal support also to make sure, you know, ask maybe that he or she comes in and just monitors my classroom to see, hey, here's what you could be doing better, here's what's going well, just so I know what I'm doing specifically wrong right. at that time. Um, all the schools in Murray County are PBIS and operational is the goal there. So do you have any uh, experience with the PBIS program? Do you believe it works? Do you have any examples? Um, and if not, um, what do you think makes up a positive learning environment? Okay. Uh, yes, I have dealt with PBIS before. Um, I think that it does work. I've seen cases where I've had students that will kind of go that extra mile to get that incentive for the classroom because they're looking forward to um, a day out for lunch or whatever, you know, purchasing some gift that they could get. So I have seen it work in my classroom. Um, I have seen some circumstances where it doesn't work mm -hmm. because the kid is just not interested right. in that. Um, but overall, I'd say that it does. Um, I'd say that um, as far as positive room environment, um, it again goes back to that teacher having an open and honest um, conversation with these kids so that they know that one, you respect them and you're listening to them. And I think that helps a lot too mm -hmm. in the classroom. I agree. Okay, so um, this in this position, we'll need you to teach a wide variety of students. You may have gifted students, you'll definitely have some EL and SWD students, mm -hmm. students with disabilities. So talk a little bit about the range of strategies you have to cover a wide range of learners. Okay. Well, of course, when you have a wide range of learners, you're going to need to differentiate your instruction. So um, having assignments that are adjusted for specific groups in your classroom to help them out. I know sometimes with EL students, pictures are helpful. Like if we're doing vocab, you might want to have some pictures with their assignment. That way they can see it and get the idea of what's behind it. Um, with my um, ESS kids, a lot of times we make sure that we'll have smaller groups um, and make sure that they can understand. Because the, the more that you can conference with a student, I feel like the better they're going to understand something. Sure. So I would definitely use conferencing and differentiated lessons um, and adjusted assignments for some students. For example, I have had an autistic student before and I've had to greatly adjust mm -hmm. what he does because he can't write like some of my other students. Right. So. And even the grouping. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. What about rigorous tasks? Um, I do have had situations where I have students in my class, even in an inclusion class, where they are um, above and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so I will do small groups for them and give them some assignments that cause some higher order thinking more than I would for my my regular group in the class because I feel like they need to be challenged also. Right. So, and um, some extra writing assignments probably for them and just things that cause them to go above and beyond mm -hmm. with, than just answering a question and knowing right. the information. Right, okay. Um, this is a multi-step question. Okay. So, everybody who has any experience in schools have had difficult students. So think about the most difficult student Okay, the one you felt like, man, I get into this student. What would that student say about you in three words? And what specific strategies um, did you try to remedy the negative behaviors? Mm -hmm. um, honestly, if I'm being honest, I'm gonna tell you that I would love to say that you know something like fair and strict, but I would probably say the words that they would call me 
for that student that I have pictured in my head right now would probably be stubborn, mm. um, occasionally harsh, and but still I'd like to think that they would consider me fair. Okay. And yeah, that's... What about the strategies? The strategies, yeah. okay. Um, typically, I would, con I, if I can still think of that student, contacted the parent, tried to get it so we could have a better classroom working relationship together, um, and just try to get us all on the same page of what do we need to do to get the student to learn in my room. Because I, we know in every circumstance that you're not going to have all kids like you. It's just never going to happen. But there's got to be some kind of mid ground that you can at least work together with that student so they can learn what they need to learn whether they like you or not. Right. So that's what I would do. All right, great. And we've, most of the teachers who've been here a while have been through Rita Pearson's Poverty and Mind training. And Rita Pearson says that kids can't learn from teachers that they don't like. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? I mostly agree with that statement. I think that there are some kids that can learn no matter what. They just have a, adapted to that, I'm going to get whatever I need out of that class. However, those kids are typically few and far between. Um, so mostly, yes, I think that having some kind of relationship with the kids on a, obviously a an appropriate teacher-student relationship is important because I know specifically for me, when kids like me or when they talk to me more, I get more out of them. So if we're having a little bit of a cut up time in class, that actually helps me in the long run because they're gonna work a little harder for me mm. when it's all said and done. Yeah. All right, um, describe specific strategies on how you would teach students to cite evidence from text, I mean specific, and how they use that evidence in their writing. Okay. Um, first of all, I think that anytime you start doing something like this, you should model the activity for them to show them kind of like key words that are going to offset what's going to be important in a text. So I would take it, put it on some kind of uh, projector, and make sure that they understand exactly what to go through first. Mm. And then I would go ahead and have them look for certain like evidence-based terms that would help them know this is important. If the author states something, if they see... Um, a for instance, anything that would just offset something that specifies to them that it would be something very important. And then um, I would make sure that they use that information in their own writing to prove whatever topic they are trying to get across, whether it's persuasive or informative. They still need to have that backup information, so they need to use that um, wisely and well within their writing. Okay, Miss Mitchell, how do you write lesson plans by unit, weekly, et cetera, and what do you include on your lesson plans? Okay, um, personally, I prefer unit lesson plans just because it gives me a whole picture mm -hmm. of what my students need to cover in a certain allotted amount of time. I struggle a little bit with daily and weekly lesson plans because I feel like you get off um, a timetable a little bit more so unit lesson plans work a little better for me okay. um, in my unit lesson plans I would usually have um, activities that we're going to do throughout the unit um, assessments that we're going to do to make sure that they have grasped their standards um, and just any other small kind of activities that we would do during that time 